Welcome to the Water Cooler Conversation from the Menzies Research Centre. I'm Nick Cater. My guest today is James Patterson, who for the last 78 months has represented the state of Victoria in the Australian Senate. Senator Patterson joins me today from Melbourne, and it's a great pleasure, James, to welcome you back to the Water Cooler Conversation. It's great to be with you, Nick, and I thought you were going to say we've been in lockdown for 78 months because it certainly feels like that in Victoria. Uh, longer than that, isn't it? But surely it can't be because we <laughs> oh, we weren't in lockdown when you gave your maiden speech, which I'll, no. I'll come to in a minute. Um, I want to talk to you really largely about two uh, inextricably linked topics today, mm -hmm. uh, COVID-19 and China. But first, let me take you back to that maiden speech I just mentioned, which I was very privileged to be present for, sitting in the gallery there in the Senate on March 16, 2016. You said, i just quote a bit back to you, you said, I've come to this place to fight for the things Liberals have long fought for. Freedom of speech, personal responsibility, federalism and free markets. Let's just take stock of those four things uh, 20 months into this pandemic. Freedom of speech, well, you know, if you don't give uh, the official line in your Facebook posts, you're liable to be shut down from the rest of the world. And the official line, incidentally, could be... Uh, you know, one moment the virus did not come from uh, a lab in China, and if you say so, your account gets cut down. Uh, a year later, it's changed. Personal responsibility. Now, I think that there's been a huge shift in personal responsibility towards managing one's health uh, and a number of other things in this. We might get onto on some of those things later. Federalism, let's not even go there. And um, and free markets. Well, the, 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 the biggest government intervention. I mean, in terms of dollars, the biggest government intervention ever, but certainly in its significance, the biggest since World War II. Um, you, those things you set out for fight, to fight for, James, we're going to continue fighting for them, I guess. But where do we go from here? Nick, there's no question that the pandemic has set back the cause of freedom uh, almost immeasurably, certainly significantly. It's had a profoundly negative effect on our personal liberties, on our ability to go about our daily lives and restricted them in a way that we never would have thought would have even been possible. As you say, on the fiscal front, it's been a big backward step, but free speech and a whole lot of other things have been restricted too. The best analogy that I can think of from history is the kind of temporary restrictions and temporary measures that are put in place during world wars. Uh, where sometimes there have been rationing and other kind of restrictions. So certainly not um, curfews or limits of moving five kilometres from your home, but similar sort of restrictions. And the key thing about, and certainly the massive expansion of government during war, certainly as a proportion of the GDP, it, it significantly spanned. The key thing about the war experience, though, is that each of those times when it happened, that it was temporary, that it didn't become permanent. And I think we face the same challenge this time. Yes, some very difficult choices have been made in order to save lives, and I think the objective evidence indicated that the Australian government's actions, for example, closing the international borders to China and then the rest of the world early on in the pandemic, bought us time for the vaccines to arrive and saved probably tens of thousands of lives. But they cannot remain in place a day longer than they are necessary, and that's the real danger and challenge we face now, is that there are some advocates out there who have come quite accustomed and quite fond of these restrictions and think that they could be used to combat other things. Uh, and we have to fight a rigorous rearguard action to return life to as much as possible, resembling that normal life we had before the pandemic. Well, let, let me tell you where I'm at now, James, and perhaps you can lift my spirits. I hope you can. So, yeah, I mean, I understand that. You have to have uh, curtailments of freedom, sometimes quite substantial curtailments of freedoms in times of emergency and and clearly we've been through such a time quite how big an emergency is another question whether it warrants you know the length of emergency time emergency powers have been in place that's another question which we might or might not mm. get to but we have been in a state of emergency and we expect those those freedoms to be returned but I last week was a game changer for me last week uh, we saw uh, demonstrations, large demonstrations, people took to the streets of Melbourne to do what one can normally do perfectly legally, and that is to state a view in a peaceful demonstration. Insofar those demonstrations started out or people went on those demonstrations with peaceful intent, that would not be against the law. Now it is illegal because a law has been passed in Parliament. No, because an edict has been signed by a non-elected official, the Chief Health Officer. Mm. 
And in response to that, the police attempt to put that edict into force to get people off the streets. And how do they do it? They use the most serious uh, non-lethal force ever used in Australia on the streets, the firing of plastic uh, bullets, plastic projectiles, rounds of 200 of them at a time. They don't have to stop to reload, and they use them ferociously, as you know. Now, if we're at that stage at the end or towards the end of this pandemic, I hope, uh, where, where are we? Where, where are we, James? I mean, we're supposed to be winding these back eventually. Shouldn't we now, at the end of the pandemic, be seeing less imposition on our freedoms, not more? Mm. Nick, I think you make a really important point about the in the putting that discretionary power in the hands of uh, non-elected uh, officials, bureaucrats, in, in this case, chief health officers. For a long time, even before I was in the parliament and in my early years in the parliament, I was concerned about this practice of handing significant state power to unelected people. There has been a tendency of legislatures, whether it's to the Australian Taxation Office or the Australian Securities and Investments Commission or the Reserve Bank or the Fair Work Commission or the, all these other quasi-judicial uh, semi-permanent uh, bodies, an enormous amount of what was previously legislative discretionary power has been vested in these discretionary organisations. And I think that is very troubling because there are real rule of law consequences for that. Those people are not up for election. They do not face, they do not have any democratic mandate or let or to, to enforce legislation. They don't have any, um, they're not exposed to the people, they don't have to justify themselves, they can't be tossed out if we don't like the decisions that they make. Only politicians can. And I am concerned that um, in the public health space that this has got been turbocharged to the, the greatest degree, the most extraordinary powers have invested in these people. And I think we have to seriously look as we get out of this pandemic and plan, unfortunately, for the probably future pandemics that we'll deal with, whether we really want to allow this kind of power to be invested in people that don't have that accountability because that democratic accountability is just so fundamental to our rule of law uh, way of life. Because a number of people are already thinking about the next pandemic and how we can prepare for it and deal with it better. Uh, we've been thinking a bit about that at the Menzies Research Centre, and I expect you know we'll be part of that conversation um, as, it, as it moves forward. It seems to me, though, we've got to fundamentally think who we put in charge. Uh, do we give this, as it has been in this case, essentially do to public health officials and everybody else just plays second fiddle or do we need a system where you know we have a broader range of people with clear responsibilities mm. for managing a pandemic including economists including actuaries including representatives from the business community including experts in mental health as well as virology um is, is well, that the way we need to go i have a very strong view on this nick which is that it is politicians who have democratic accountability who must make the decisions. They have access to all of those sources of expert advice and they should listen to it carefully and weigh it up and they should give very due deference towards the health advice and they shouldn't lightly dismiss it. But ultimately, it shouldn't be any one component of those that rules over the other. They all have to be balanced in consideration. And only a politician who has that democratic accountability and that legitimacy earned from a mandate from the people can make that, those final decisions. And so I don't think it's about constructing a new structure with carefully balanced mental health person on the one hand and economist on the other and you know, mother of children on the other, there's no perfect structure that you could put in place that would balance all those competing demands and none of it would have the democratic legitimacy. All of it comes back to the centrality in a democratic system of politicians making decisions and being accountable for them. And it, I don't think it will be good enough in the future to say that we just followed the health advice because although the health advice is very important and should be taken very seriously, it is not the only piece of information we have to consider. Well, that's very refreshing to hear, James. Uh, it shouldn't be you know, so surprising to hear it, but we don't hear that line expressed firmly and clearly enough, I don't think, from our elected representatives at the moment. This idea that, that the buck stops with them, that they are, in the end, responsible. Part of this responsibility argument that you've you put forward on your maiden speech. So let's go to your state. Uh, uh, Victoria, Premier Daniel Andrews today announced 1,400 plus new cases. Obviously, it's not a a, a great day for him, uh, but what, how did he react? Did he come out and mm. did he uh, contritely say, well, sorry, you let the people of Victoria down, that, you know, the health services weren't up to scratch or whatever? No, no. He came into a press conference and blamed the people of Victoria for causing this spike. Their poor behaviour, they're not following the rules, they're having 
parties because it happened to be grand final day, you know, a day that he actually gives a, makes a public holiday, by the way, in advance to, uh, to emphasise the importance of. That, that's not taking responsibility, is it? It might be apocryphal, Nick, but there is a, a quote attributed to Leonard Brezhnev, a Soviet premier, who said that um, we have to elect a better people. Uh, instead of you know people electing better governments, it's uh, it's the governments that have been let down by their people, and their people didn't live up to the task. And there's a bit of that sort of sentiment, certainly among the enthusiastic supporters on Twitter and elsewhere of, of Daniel Andrews, that he's this perfect leader being let down by these flawed Victorian people. Um, the truth is that. Uh, the compliance of the Victorian people and any other people is a finite resource. I think actually there's been remarkably high degrees of compliance throughout this pandemic. But as we approach 250 days in lockdown, I am not surprised at all that it is fraying at the edges. And I really think the events this week where Victoria has surpassed now comfortably the New South Wales case numbers, even though Victoria locked down sooner and more firmly than New South Wales did, is that final nail in the coffin of that COVID zero, zero ideology that said that, you know, we can eliminate an infectious disease if only we are determined enough uh, and tough enough on it. Well, the reality is, particularly with the Delta variant and its higher degree of infectiousness, that it probably can't be defeated by any sort of lockdown, no matter how harsh it is, certainly if it's in a large city like Melbourne. And I wish we had that insight uh, a long time ago because I think it would have avoided an awful lot of pain for Victorians. I suspect a lot of the controls that imp imposed upon us have not actually added much on the public health front. Certainly, we haven't seen the public health evidence, for example, as to why curfews, which have not been used uh, largely in New South Wales but have been used widely in Victoria, are, are medically justified and have the scientific evidence to back it up. And so I, I really hope that there has been more reflection on the part of the Premier and his government than he has publicly admitted um, because he was the most influential advocate of COVID-0 in Australia and it has now been proven on his watch to yeah, be a failure. Yeah, well, it's dead. It was dead, dead months ago for anybody who was following the, the spread of the Delta variant in the UK and elsewhere. But anyway, look, mm. the, the, there are some encouraging signs out of this. So if you look at the pattern, uh, I mean, almost every jurisdiction in the world has had lockdowns in some form or another. But if you look at the pattern in the United States between the Democrat states and the Republican states, there's a clear pattern emerges. Uh, the Republican states have had more um, thought given to business and, and freedoms and, and the lockdowns have been less severe, less long, less onerous. Uh, the same in this country, I think, is true too. Certainly if you include New Zealand, without a doubt, the most uh, uh, egregious impositions on personal freedom have come in New Zealand uh, Victoria, um, Queensland, Western Australia to some extent if you, you think of the border lockdowns. So clearly Liberal governments are to some extent acting like Liberal governments but, but given that you know one of the, the basic things about a Liberal approach is we don't, we, don't, uh, we don't generally agree with a top-down command approach to any problem, we like a bottom-up solution, how could we have done this you know even more liberally in an even more liberal fashion. Mm. Nick, I think it's not too late for Australia to still have the best of both worlds, to have avoided the mass casualties that we have seen in overseas jurisdictions and to return freedoms to our citizens very quickly. But we do need to get onto that latter part of it, of returning those freedoms very swiftly, because certainly if you look at the evidence of the deaths on a, on a per capita basis, you know, in the United States and the United Kingdom, about 2,000 people have died for every million people. In Australia, it's 48 people for every million people. That is unquestionably an impressive result. And I think it was those tough early decisions like closing the international borders that bought us the time until vaccines were developed and now have been able to be rolled out and administered. But if we continue to cling on to those restrictions now that we do have very widespread vaccination, now that the vulnerable populations are already largely vaccinated and every, almost everyone else has ne nearly had the opportunity to be get be both their initial jab and their second one, uh, the ongoing justification for these lockdowns and other restrictions become really, really hard to justify. I I've been thinking for some time, for example, that hotel quarantine um, really uh, is looking like a, an unnecessary ongoing impost, given the massive cost it has, both social cost and economic cost, and the fact that we're now having 
many hundreds of cases a day in New South Wales and Victoria each, over a thousand in Victoria today, and only one or two in hotel quarantine. So if we didn't have the hotel quarantine system, instead of there being 1,400 cases today in Victoria, there might have been 1,401 or 1,402. For the massive cost imposed by hotel quarantine, I don't think it's justified. And so we, we need to rapidly move to, I hope initially first, hotel home quarantine on a shortened basis, and then ultimately no quarantine at all if you can have a negative test or prove that you're fully vaccinated or other measures of assurance. So we can have that freedom of international travel return to us as soon as possible. Um, but of course, most of the restrictions that have been imposed in the pandemic, most of the harshest ones have been imposed by state governments, and it's really the, the burden falls heaviest on them for them to act. Yeah, well, it's only fair having having sort of run the ruler over your profession, uh, politics, we should run the ruler over my former <laughs> profession of journalism. And, and I think the same picture, right? There have been some dismal, dismal uh, failures of duty in journalism, but there have been some shining examples of journalism, journalists doing what they're supposed to do. And, and let's single out one Shari Markson, who's just published mm. uh, a book, uh, What Really Happened in Wuhan. She's doggedly su stuck, stuck at this story, even when she was being labelled a conspiracy theorist seven times in one program on the ABC's mm. Media Watch. And, uh, you know, it, it now looks as if she's onto something. Uh, the explanation which she posits that the coronavirus didn't jump straight from bats to humans but had an intermediate step where it was engineered it was uh, put through this game of function uh, research to make it even more potent in the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, now seems to look like to me the most likely explanation now uh, let's go to you James because you as in addition to just being a very smart person who, who looks at the word in a curious way you're also chair of the parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and I'm not asking you to give secrets away, but you may have be, be privy to some extra information I'm not. How does this look to you? I mean, on mm. the balance of probabilities, where does this lie now from, say, naught to 100? And what are the implications of whatever conclusion you've come to? Nick, I've been thinking the remarkable thing is that every major newspaper in the world doesn't have someone like Shari on this story investigating this question because it still is an unresolved question. We still do not know how and when and exactly where the COVID virus originated. It's a very good reason to suspect that it's from Wuhan uh, and there's very good reason to suspect it spread from there. But beyond that, there's actually not a great deal that we can, sa we can say. And it is a complex scientific question, and it's made more complex by the fact that it originated in the territory controlled by an authoritarian government, which has interests in covering it up. Um, but reasonable questions about when and how it ar arrived uh, is, is it the, the least that we could expect. There are more than 4 million people so far that have died in official records from COVID, but experts think it could be three times higher than that, up to 12 million people have died. It surprises me that people aren't more curious about the origins. It, turning to the, the actual question itself, um, the honest truth is we don't know. All we know for sure is that the very early uh, exposure of the virus was not well handled by the Chinese Communist Party, that people who blew the whistle and drew attention to its spread uh, and its existence were uh, persecuted and penalised and punished. Uh, and one of them, Dr. Li Wenyang, one of the doctors who drew attention to it, this very sadly died, was very harshly punished. And it doesn't instill me or the rest of the world with confidence that the Chinese Communist Party isn't willing to be open and transparent about that. It is possible that it is of natural origin and that the only thing that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to cover up from the world is their role in mismanaging it at that early stage. But it's also possible uh, that it did come out about as a result of an accident at the Wuhan Institute of Virology or another similar institute, and that what the Chinese Communist Party wants to obscure from the world is their role, in fact, in accidentally creating this virus in the first place and unleashing it on the world. Um, now, both of those things are bad for the Chinese Communist Party, but the second would obviously be much more dire for their international standing. So um, we have to rigorously interrogate that, and that even the World Health Organization organization says that the access that they had and the process they were allowed to conduct in the first instance was not satisfactory is all the evidence I need to know that we need more transparency and more examination of this question and not less. Well transparency is what we desperately need from China on a, a lot of fronts uh, and the downside of that is it means we, we sometimes draw into speculation. I don't want to do that in this discussion. Let's stick to the facts as we know it and, and move on to um, Something you said in Parliament quite recently, last month in August, uh, you were uh, participating in the debate on changes to foreign intelligence uh, 
legislation, um, obviously uh, based on a report which uh, had come from the committee you, chain, you chair, the Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and you, you said this, James, we are operating in a very different security environment from the one we were operating in just five years ago. Foreign interference and espionage is at, an un at, at unprecedented levels, unprecedented levels, higher than they have been ever, including at the height of the Cold War. Now, that's quite a statement, right? And you go on then to say, you know, what's on the public record that the Director General of ACO, Mike Burgess, says that uh, it's, it's confirmed that this rise in activity is overwhelmingly driven from China. So th that's, let's put park that on one side as we set up this next section of the conversation. So unprecedented levels of, of espionage from China. So then we have last week the um, former Prime Minister Paul Keating jump into the debate uh, and uh, attack um, the Prime Minister, attack his government, uh, attack the, the Fairfax media, attack everybody it seems for coming up with the conclusion that there could possibly be conflict with China. Uh, the, and he says this, the notion that Ch Australia is in a state of military apprehension about China or needs to be is a distortion and a lie of the worst and most grievous proportions. By its propagation, Australia is determinedly casting China as an enemy and in the doing of it, actually creating an enemy where none exists. I find it difficult to reconcile Paul Keating's statement with the one you made to Parliament. Would you like to try and do it for me? I wish that I could, but it's impossible to rationalise because it's not based on evidence and it is totally irrational. Um, Paul Keating, at the very best and the most very um, complimentary reading, is 30 years out of date with his intelligence briefings and hasn't kept up with the very radically different world that we now operate in. But I suspect um, that because he has a very strong worldview, he's very determined to hold on to, that no matter what access he had to intelligence briefings today, he would stick to the lines that he have, has been propagating. I, I thought he was totally out of line uh, this week and last week with those attacks on the government and also his attacks on his former Labor colleagues, including Penny Wong and Anthony Albanese and others. Um, but actually, it was a few months ago, but a, uh, some time ago now, a year ago, before the um, at the Labor Party National Conference when he called... Uh, the heads of our security agencies nutters and he said that if the Labor Party were to win the election that they should all be sacked. Now that was a disgraceful slur on very professional public servants who are working in the national interest. I work very regularly with Mike Burgess at ASIO, with Rachel Noble at the Australian Signals Directorate, with Paul Simon at ASIS and many other people in the intelligence com community and they are patriotic, dedicated, passionate people who above all else just want to serve our country and its best interests. And to imply that we are like some kind of South American dictatorship where a new government would come to office and get rid of all the security services and put in their own mates was a, a grossly irresponsible thing to do. And he was um, politely slapped down at the time by his Labor colleagues. But really, people with views that extreme and that outrageous shouldn't be welcome in any polite society. And they certainly shouldn't mm. be deified in the way that he is by the modern Labor Party. You know, even this week, Anthony Albanese is writing uh, articles where he, he you know, tips the, the, hat, the hat to Paul Keating and you know, says how wonderful he is and other Labor MPs have done the same. He, he doesn't deserve that level of stature and respect that he has today. Not, it doesn't mean he didn't achieve good things as a Prime Minister. It doesn't mean he wasn't a, uh, didn't, wasn't a significant figure in our history. Um, but he's a sad diminutive figure from what he was and I think we should treat him accordingly. Um, let's put him in a kindly light. I mean, in his defence, things have moved on since, since 1993, sorry, when he stopped, uh, when he uh, involuntarily, 1996 I should say, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, when he involuntarily stepped down as, as Prime Minister. I mean, the internet had hardly started then. And some of the things you were fixing in this legislation uh, last week, the foreign intelligence, or last month, the foreign intelligence legislation reflected this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. back in his day, uh, you could track uh, the source of an incoming phone call because it had a, you know, it came from an Australian number or it had an mm -hmm. international code in front of it. Now, of course, uh, so much is happening on, on the net uh, coming in. Um, you just, you know, the source of it is harder to trace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and also, we now have this this whole new area, which which would have been science fiction when Paul Keating was in in um, 
in the in office called cyber warfare. You know, the yeah. ability of of foreign governments, foreign businesses, you know, foreign criminals, anybody you mm -hmm. like, to to get in and attack us from within the computer networks. You've written about this recently. Tell me where where are we at in terms mm. of our cyber preparedness? What more do we have to do? You're right, Nick. That the world has changed dramatically, not just in 30 years, but in five years on this front. Um, and the exponential trends that our intelligence agencies are seeing in cyber warfare um, is beyond even what our worst fears would have been five years ago, let alone 30 years ago. This really is an incredibly comprehensive challenge, and there is really no area of public or commercial life that is untouched by this. Uh, figures from the Cyber Security Centre within the Australian Signals Directorate indicate that once every 32 minutes, critical infrastructure within Australia is under some form of cyber attack. And that does include both state and non-state actors. And then it ranges from uh, a foreign hostile state that might be trying to pre-position on a critical infrastructure network so that they could potentially disrupt it in a way that would uh, destabilise Australia and prevent us from projecting our power into the region or responding to an event or supporting our friends and allies, to criminal gangs who are pro trying to place ransomware technology on there for profit. Um, and it is very, very, really very troubling and we're going to need to do a lot to address it. There's things that government needs to do, but there's things that industry needs to do as well. Um, government ha has asked and, and I believe will be granted by the parliament um, emergency powers to step in in the event that a, a entity is unwilling or unable to deal with a serious cyber attack. And I think um, industry should be obliged to mandatory report that to government so that we have full visibility. But in addition to that, industry needs to do more to invest to protect itself as a preventative me measure because many businesses, we believe, have nowhere near sufficient cybersecurity uh, infrastructure in place to protect themselves. And they don't just have a duty to their own customers and clients and shareholders, although that's a very important duty. They've also really got a duty to the nation at large and underinvestment in that is not justifiable. So we're going to need both parts of that comprehensive response in order to be protected from this threat. Condoleezza Rice, who was, of course, Secretary of State uh, during the 9-11 um, atrocities, uh, the anniversary of which we had recently, uh, was interviewed recently by Peter Robinson on a podcast. And, and, and Peter asked, well, well look, 9-11 uh, was something that came out of the blue. It was something that wasn't predicted. We just didn't expect uh, an attack of that nature, of that size. What will the next black swan, if you like, the next black swan mm -hmm. event be? And, and Condoleezza Rice said, well, cyber security. That will be where it comes from in her considered view. So what's your thinking from what you see and read and hear? Is it likely that we're going to wake up one day uh, to find a 9-11 size attack on the internet or something of similar dimensions? Do we at least have to brace or prepare ourselves for that kind of possibility? Unfortunately, Nick, I think Condoleezza Rice is right. And even with the best resources and the smartest people and the best preparation, there's no guarantee that we can prevent that from happening. We can mitigate it, we can reduce the risk, we can um, limit the harm, but we probably can't eliminate that threat uh, completely. And so a couple of things spring from that. One is we need to do that preparedness and that defensive work and, and make sure we are as hardened as possible against that external threat. But the second thing we need to do is to make sure our society and our economy um, is resilient as possible to withstand that when it comes. One of the things I worry about in an interconnected society and how dependent we now are on things like telecommunications is that um, you could uh, do enormous harm to Australia just by taking out our payment systems network because so many people are now reliant on making electronic payments for even the most basic transactions. And so few little people hold cash and operate in cash transactions. In fact, it's basically banned in COVID anyway. Um, and so how would we respond as a society to that if it happened? Are we prepared for that, um, even just mentally prepared for that? And will we have the resilience to get through that? Because if we are in the, inwardly focused on dealing with a problem like that, and there is a regional crisis, and it could be a military one, but it could also be an environmental one or a humanitarian one, we're going to be much less able to respond to that and to protect our interests in relation to that if we're, we're kind of internally focused. So there's an awful lot of work that needs to happen at all levels of society. It's it's an individual personal responsibility. It's a corporate responsibility. It's a government responsibility. Let's go to another, another aspect of Paul Keating's criticisms, and that was specifically that we're somehow going backwards uh, by uh, forming a, a new alliance, a new closer alliance with uh, 
United States and and uh, Britain, AUKUS, as we as we now call it, uh, and that you know our future was with Asia, and we shouldn't be looking back. How how do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, uh, I guess you'll agree with me that it was it was a very positive move. But talk me through. Mm. I find it really difficult, genuinely, to understand Paul Keating's critique here. He is saying that we're going to become more dependent on the United States and the United Kingdom and our allies, and we're going to be less sovereign and able to defend ourselves. But in fact, as a result of this agreement, the US government and the UK government are effectively handing us the crown jewels, the, the keys to the castle, their most sensitive military capability, not just nuclear submarines, but on a whole range of things, that we are now going to, in the future, possess ourselves and be at our disposal, and we're not going to be reliant on others. So if there is a, a regional crisis, we'll be able to send our own nuclear submarines to meet that challenge. We won't be asking the United States or won't be reliant on the United States to send their nuclear submarines to do it. So it actually underpins our independence and our sovereignty and makes us more secure, not less secure. And that's a fundamentally positive thing. I mean, I think it is reassuring to have that US commitment to Australia's security. I think that does send a very good message to the region, but equally important to that philosophical or rhetorical commitment is the real hard capability that will come with it that will mean that we are a much more credible force in the region that we won't just have a clear intent but we'll have clear capability to back up that intent and we'll be taken more seriously by our partners by our friends and by those to wish to do us harm you can see what what israel uh, the direction in which israel has been moving for the last 20 years certainly for the last 10 years to greater self-reliance uh, you know israel well uh, greater sovereign capability and they've done a lot of this with technology uh to the point where you know they obviously united states support our support is very important to them but they're they're much more capable now of defending themselves against whatever comes than they were 20 years ago is that the direction which we should be moving in as your your colleague uh, senator jim molan strongly argues um uh, and have we got the capacity have we got the ability to do that, both in terms of our you know, physical capabilities, mm. but also, I guess, our, our our moral capacity to focus on that against all the other things that we want mm. governments to spend money on. Oh, look, I think there's no question it's right that we have to do more to be able to defend ourselves because we just don't know what the circumstances of future conflicts are and whether our friends will be able to come to our aid, even if they're willing to come to our aid because of the nature of that that conflict might uh, entail. So we do have to do more. There is a really big and important caveat that, to that though, and that is that a nation of 25 million people of, of Australia can never replicate or replace the security guarantee provided by the United States of America with its population of 330 odd million. Um, they're just the economies of scale don't allow us to have that level of uh, force, posture and projection that they have. And even if we devoted 100% of our GDP to that task, we would still not be able to meet that challenge. So we do have to do more. But in fact, I think the US alliance is more important than ever before. And we have to double down on that alliance and invest on that alliance because it is our most important security guarantor. Even if it was only for the technology transfer that we're going to gain out of AUKUS, it would be worthwhile, let alone the actual capability, whether it's marine rotations uh, through Darwin and maybe on a more permanent or ongoing basis, whether it's US ships visiting and stationing in our ports, whether that's in fact having them sustained and maintained uh, from our ports. Those would be really positive things which would add to our uh, defence capability and our deterrent capability for uh, actors in the region. Um, can I go to a, a, a question which reflects, I think, on you and your generation, or, or the question is about you and your generation. So here we are. We're talking about serious, weighty matters here, right? We're talking about the possibility of conflict, armed conflict, Australia being, you know, in a, in a, in a seriously difficult position in a way perhaps it hasn't been since World War II. Now, World War II, uh, you and I look up and admire the people of that generation. I was one generation removed to them, uh, my, my children two and my granddaughter three. So, uh, th th we, and, and we've been fortunate enough to live through this marvellous period of prosperity and largely peace, I have to say. There have been wars, but nothing on that scale, certainly nothing that ever threatened us domestically here in Australia, if, if you if you put terrorism in one basket. So here's the question, and, and a lot of people are asking this, I'm not the only one. 
do you think that uh, people of your generation will have the, the moral courage and the moral fibre? Will they be able to show that in the same way that the wartime generation did? I think that's one of those unanswerable questions, Nick, until the events present themselves. We wouldn't have known that the greatest generation was the greatest generation until it faced and overcame the challenges that it did. Uh, and I don't, we don't know what my generation or future generations will be capable of either, uh, except that I am encouraged by the trends in public opinion and the very strong support for liberal democracy and our values in the region. I mean, there's been a real waking up over the last five years, and it's really evident in the polling from organisations like the Lowe Institute, where we're having now very much more realistic and honest conversation about the challenges we threat face. We understand much better countries like China and their intentions. We don't have that um, you know, woolly-eyed optimism of the, you know 2015 and earlier, where there was just frankly a mass naivety about that, um, we're having a much more realistic conversation, and we are more we are more understanding of the seriousness of the times we're in. And I think ultimately, I think we will rise to that challenge because, uh, for all the criticisms of my generation and those younger, I don't think that if faced with the choice of losing what they have. Uh, uh, for a system of government which would be much, much more uh, hostile to live under, that they would, that way, they would willingly succumb to that. To stay on that point and look, look to what the next generation of political leaders uh, will look like. You, you are a part of a, a, a quite a, a change, a revolution, if you like, in the Senate. Certainly on the Liberal side, in that there's been an influx of, of younger, uh, mm. for very smart people on the Liberal uh, national side, but largely on the li Liberal side in the Senate. You know, we're talking about Amanda Stoker. We're talking about Senator James Hume. We're talking about, I'm not, I'm not going to single them out because there's too many and uh, and, and it would be unfair on the people I, I failed to mention. Uh, I find this enormously encouraging. Uh, and uh, am I, you, you work with these people every day. Am I overstating it? Do we have a fantastic next generation in the Senate and also in the House? I don't think you are ever studying it, Nick. I'm encouraged like you are. Um, I have an incredible group of colleagues, particularly those that have been elected in the last few years, who come from a very diverse range of backgrounds but are united by a very strong sense of purpose, by, uh, who are very sincerely committed to their values and their beliefs and are determined to fight for it. And uh, I think that's a really positive thing. I think they're hopefully is among our generation, less of the kind of uh, careerism that has defined some previous generations of parliamentarians, a much more focused generation, because I think we realise the sacrifices of public life and politics are pretty significant, not just personally, but particularly for our families. And it's not worth it unless you're here for a purpose, unless you're here to do something. And the moment that you're just here to make up numbers and go along with the flow, then that's the moment you should leave and, and get out and, get, and hand it over to someone else because there's so many other ways in which you can have a satisfying life uh, other than just flying to Canberra to, to vote as you're told. Um, so uh, it is a really driven generation of people and I hope that we maintain uh, that drive and that ambition for our country uh, as we uh, continue through our careers. Oh, and you, you've never heard, I've never heard you, James, complain about your job, so I'm not going to invite you to. Uh, but I will say this, so it does seem to me that uh, in the 24-hour uh, digitally driven, social media dominated world in which we are, I think there are pressures on politicians, there are pressures on everybody in public life, but politicians notably that weren't there, let's go say, go back to Paul Keating's day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can see they take their toll on some good people, uh, Nicole. Yeah. Flint's leaving after just two terms. She's not the only one. You know, you had a, a premier like Mike Baird in New South Wales who seemed to be, it was a terrific premier, but he was sort of there and gone in a flash and, and it was because of, you know, pressures on his family life and all sorts of things. How can we, is this, is this what we're going to see now? We're going to see a revolving door of people more and more or do you think we can find ways in which we can overcome or, or, or stand up to the increased stresses of social media and everything else and, yeah. and have people who build a career? Well, one of the things I've observed, Nick, is that uh, I think political careers are becoming shorter. 
Um, you know, look at someone like Matthias Cormann. He was actually only in the Senate for a little bit more than a decade. Um, he achieved an enormous amount in that time. He was a phenomenally successful and influential politician. He's gone on to do other important work at the OECD. But in generations gone by, someone like Matthias Cormann would be expected to be in the Senate for 20 or 30 years, not, not just, you know, 12 or 13 years. I think that is a change. It's, it's coming about because you're right that the pressures are greater and uh, the toll that that takes on uh, parliamentarians and their families in particular is greater. And people are only willing to subject themselves to that for so long before they want to go and do other things and, and, and not have that pressure. I think that will be a trend that continues. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, uh, I, I think there is something um, not quite right about certainly the vast bulk of MPs being there for a really long time. It's good to have some experienced people, but you wouldn't want a system where um, all your parliament parliamentarians did 30-year uh, services in the parliament. That wouldn't be healthy or balanced. Um, but we do have to be very careful that if there is going to be that high rate of turnover, that you don't lose too much institutional knowledge and perspective that can be incredibly valuable and can be passed down uh, between generations of parliamentarians. I, I think we would lose something if everybody had quite sh quick, sharp, sharp, short careers went in, went out, because you do gain perspective over time. It does take time to understand how the system works, how to influence it for positive outcomes. And uh, if everybody's on their training wheels and then leaves five minutes afterwards, well, then I think you're going to have a, um, a less effective parliament. Well, I, I'd, I'd emphasise that point. I mean, Robert Menzies, right, our great, our great mm -hmm. um, mentor, he, he'd, had a, he'd had a parliamentary career if you had, you know, Victorian state parliament and federal parliament. As long as Matthias Cormans, he gets to the end of his first prime ministership, uh, he then sits around in the background, forms a whole new party, and then comes and mm. and is prime minister for another seventeen years. You know, that's incredible time. Yeah. So, but you know, people like you who study the career and life of Robert Menzies would know he, he was only able to build that second prime ministership on the experience that he'd had in the first. So. This, is, this yeah. is actually a serious problem, isn't it? It's probably a more serious problem than you were, you were willing to admit. <laughs> it, it, one of the things I've learned since I got to Parliament, Nick, is that no matter how experienced you are outside of politics and outside of Parliament in your pre-politics life and your professional life, um, and no matter what age you are when you get elected, there is quite a steep learning curve just to work out how politics works. And it doesn't actually matter whether you've come from something closely adjacent to politics or something completely different. So if you enter at age 50, having had a wonderful business career and made a lot of money and think you can be prime minister after a term or two, yeah. um, I think parliament shows uh, and politics in recent history has shown that is not a good idea. Uh, that does not work well. There is something unique about this uh, life and, uh, and it does take some time to get your head around it. That's right. But things move on, things change, and we have to adapt with the times. James, um, uh, thank you for, for, for standing up for those values so well. I don't think it's any fault of yours that we're now in retreat on many of those issues around freedom. Uh, something intervened in the meanwhile, but I, you know, it's a great reassurance to a lot of us to know there are people like you still committed to winning back those freedoms that are so important to us. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Nick, and thank you for the work that the Menzies Research Centre does, which I can't tell you enough gives steel to our spines and um, ammunition uh, for our, our, our yeah, arrows for our quiver. Uh, it really is very important to what we do. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining me today on Water Cooler. And uh, if, you, if you enjoy this podcast, you can support us, of course, by subscribing to the Menzies Research Centre from just $10 a month. You go to menziesrc.org slash subscribe. And if that's too difficult... To remember, there's a QR code over my shoulder. Uh, you know the drill. <laughs> QR codes are part of our life. Thank you very much for watching or listening to this podcast, and we look forward to welcoming you back in, uh, again soon to another water cooler conversation. Mm -hmm.